Welcome to Connecting Communities. I'm your host, Nancy Bocci. With me today is Lieutenant Jim Keenan from the Somerville Fire Department. Thank you for coming on, Jim. My pleasure, as always. Yes. So every year I have you on as a guest so that we can talk about Fire Prevention Week. This year that will be coming up the week of October 8th. And we like to provide information to the community regarding safety tips, things that they may not have thought of already in terms of what to do in case of, God forbid, there is a fire. Um, I did want to share a little information about this year's campaign. It is entitled, Look, Listen, Learn, Be Aware, Fire Can Happen Anywhere. Seems very straightforward. I know they always like to have those as kind of a quick way to engage with people. And then there's bits of information about each of those. So if we start with the first one, which is look, look for places fire could start, take a good look around your home, identify potential fire hazards, and take care of them. So when we think of that, take a good look around your home, what sorts of things should people be looking for? Well, the first things is uh, anything that could start a fire, mm -hmm. lighters, matches, candles. Um, you want to make sure they're out of reach of children, first of all. Like any mm -hmm. lighters or matches, you want to keep on a cabinet you know, that's high enough that they can't reach. You can put one of those child safety locks on in mm -hmm. case they get up on a chair. Good point. Yeah. Um, when we're cooking, you want to make sure there's nothing near the stove. You know, sometimes you come in hurried from sh shopping and you throw mm -hmm. the bags on the counter, you start cooking. Now you got a paper or plastic bag mm -hmm. there that could ignite. Or even the, the, the dish towels or the oven mitts, anything that can burn. You want to keep it at least three feet away from, from the stove. Mm -hmm. We also want to make sure we have good... Uh, um, habits of keeping place the place clean you know you don't want uh, like a lot of paper and boxes and stuff combust. yeah you know like in the you know nearby or in the hallways if something does start mm -hmm. so we got to keep uh, safety that way nice uh, the next part they emphasize is listen so it talks about listening for the sound of the smoke alarm you can only have minutes to escape safely once the alarm sounds and then we want to talk about going outside to a designated meeting place mm-hmm well, we always say your best protection, your first and best protection is having working smoke and uh, carbon, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide mm -hmm. detectors. Uh, that gives you that early warning, you know, because we always, when, like when we go into the schools, I think we've talked about this, we always get a kid that will say, well, what happens if the whole room, you know, is on fire? And, and that doesn't happen immediately, it does happen quickly, right. but it doesn't normally happen immediately. So when you hear that smoke detector sounding, or the, or the carbon monoxide detector too. You want to investigate. Get outside if you see see a smell, smoke, or fire. You know, we, there's oftentimes we have these alarms going off, and we go to buildings, and people don't even come out of their apartments or their mm -hmm. homes. You know, so you want to make sure. You know, get if you hear that alarm, get up, go out. If you see a smell, smoke, or fire, mm -hmm. go out. Of, and you want to have two ways out of the house. This is the escape drills in the home we've yeah. always talked about, Edith. Um, so you want to plan two ways out of the home, and I usually say the two easiest ways is your front door and your back door. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people will say, well, how about a window? And I'm like, yeah, if you're on the first floor, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And you want to go to that meeting place. It's a place that's a safe distance away where everyone in the house goes to. That way we know that everybody's out safely mm -hmm. and we can just fight the fire and not have to worry about finding you, which we will do, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, that I think is something that really bears emphasizing because you can imagine in a situation like that, you're disoriented, it's, it's very nerve-wracking, right? And if you're not going to that spot, I think it's automatic that you would double back, whether it's a family member, you know, something like that, you would automatically feel you would need to go back in to check on that. So having the space where you're able to count off one, two, three, four, five, everybody's here, that provides valuable information to the fire department in terms of fighting the fire as opposed to looking for people in the home at the same time. Yes, of course, every time fire we go to, we do a primary mm -hmm. search and then a secondary search. But if you, you know, if you have that information for us that everybody's out, mm -hmm. that makes our, our job a little easier and we can attack the fire uh, a lot more quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, the third part of the theme this year is learn. So it ta emphasizes, as you had mentioned, learning two ways out of every room and making certain that the doors and windows open easily and are free of clutter. And I think this is something that is equally important to talk about as well. We're familiar with our homes in the daytime, in the nighttime, not filled with smoke, not in a rush to get out, not, I imagine that things that you know as the back of your hand instantly become foreign territory in the sense of just trying to get out, making certain everyone is with you. 
and then realizing we all do it. You, as you said, you walk in the house, you drop your keys, you drop this, mm -hmm. things build up, you know, it's the day before recycling, so the stuff's near yeah. the door, mm -hmm. all of that, and realizing that in an emergency, you would then kind of have to be finagling around with some of that stuff as well. I mean, when I read that information, like making certain your windows open easily, I solidly know there are three windows in my house that I haven't opened in a year. Yeah. So I don't know that they would open easily in case of an emergency. Yeah, and, we, and a lot of houses in Somerville are old, and mm -hmm. they've been painted over, and they're yes. hard to open, you know, mm -hmm. they're hard to open. You might have to break it. But this thing we talked about um, learning, and this is why we talk about practicing. Mm -hmm. Like you said, now, um, we always tell people to make these plans, escape plans, and to practice them with their children. It's like uh, the Patriots. They need to practice some more. They're not playing so well. They do. So it, what it is, for us and, and especially the kids, it gives them, you know, th that second of, uh, th they're not that surprised. Like, uh, oh, yeah, I remember, we practiced right. this. And we talked about, it, you know, you want to practice it at night. It doesn't have to be 2 in the morning. It gets mm -hmm. dark early, you know. Seven, eight o'clock, it's dark. Just shut off all the lights, pretend it's two in the morning, mm -hmm. and press the alarm. You know, tell your kids, you don't want to surprise right. them too much. But it's just like practicing, um, you know, a, a play in a sporting mm -hmm. game. You know, it just it's, makes it a little easier when you know what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. I think that's good because people do, you fall back into familiar behavior. So even with all of the kind of external variables happening, you're still like, okay, so now that I hear this alarm, here's the door I should go out of. Even that sense of, you know, put your hand on the door, is the door hot, mm -hmm. all of those sort of things that if you continue to practice, I think just become ingrained and in the moment, you're really relying almost on muscle memory to get you through it as opposed to trying to figure it out in the heat of the moment. No pun intended with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why we do it. You know, like, that's why we have the SAFE program, Student Awareness of Fire Education, and we go in the schools to, you know, to teach these kids this stuff. So they do have some knowledge and, and it's, you know, they have an investment, mm -hmm. you know, and then they might go home and say, you know, mom, watch that candle. It's, you know, too close to the curtains or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, something like to that effect. You know, it's knowledge is power. That's, mm -hmm. what, that's the whole idea behind what we're doing today, Definitely. what we do in the schools, what we do with the seniors. Mm -hmm. It's just knowledge is power. You, you know, sometimes you just go, oh, geez, I didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. It happens. But if you know it, you know, you can practice it. It really does. I will say I continually hear your voice in my head when I go to put the water on to pee in a robe and like, don't do it because you don't realize like it just is a habit to do. The sleeves are hanging very low. I automatically, for some reason, reach for the furthest burner and not realizing like at the time what could happen. And you're, you know, you're distracted. You're trying to get the yeah. caffeine and not realizing that. But I do consistently hear you saying the robe should have a rubber band on it to make certain that the sleeves aren't going to fall into the fire. Yeah. I mean... We all do it. I did it recently. I was boiling some eggs, and uh, then I ran down the cellar to throw in some laundry, and, uh, you know, and I don't know, I got a phone call, whatever it was. Yeah. All of a sudden, I had the smoke detector going off. It pot had boiled off, yeah. and my eggs were burning. I'm like, uh. you know, and I've been a firefighter over 33 <laughs> years. But so that's you have important to know it. I mean, even for someone who this is your livelihood, there's still that sense we are all distracted. Things get your attention, and I know, you know, you come into the house and be like, I'm going to do this in a minute, or that will only take a minute. I do the same thing to run downstairs and be like, I'll only be there for a minute. And then you're like, while I'm down here, I should look for this or pick up that. And then you realize you've been gone for 10 minutes, and mm -hmm. circumstances change very quickly. In our senior program, um, it's called Fall and Fire Prevention for Seniors. Uh, one of the things we tell them is when they start to cook, set the time, set a timer, you mm. know, and it, and it could, like what we're talking about, we can do it too, but especially, you know, if your memory starts to fail mm -hmm. a little bit, most microwaves have the timer, or, you know, you might have one of those old wind-up mm -hmm. timers, your, your phone, whatever. Yep. Uh, it's not a bad idea to do that, like you said, because it's so easy to get distracted. We have so many distract, you know, our, mm -hmm. our phones, our computers, I know. you know, all kinds of stuff always something we're trying to get your attention. Yeah. <laughs> um, in just a moment, we're going to watch a clip, and I did just want to share a little of the information about that. So this was produced by the National Fire Prevention Association and commemoration of the Great Chicago Fire, which began on October 8th, 1871, caused devastating damage. And these numbers are horrifying. I know that you're familiar with them, but it really, when you hear it out loud. So this uh, fire killed more than 250 people left 100,000 homeless, destroyed more than 17,400 structures, and burned more than 2,000 acres of land. Those numbers are just mind-boggling. It really is hard to imagine something 
just spiraling so out of control and the damage that fire can cause to a community. Um, so since 1922, the National Fire Prevention Association has sponsored the public observance of Fire Prevention Week. And in 1925, President Calvin Coolidge proclaimed Fire Prevention Week a national observance, making it the longest running public health observance in our country. During Fire Prevention Week, children, adults, and teachers learn how to stay safe in case of a fire. Firefighters provide life-saving public education in an effort to drastically decrease casualties caused by fire. So we really wanted to make certain we got this show out so that it is able to air in time for Fire Prevention Week and share as much information as possible. So do you want to take a moment and look at the clip? Yes. yes. Great, let's mm -hmm. do that. The Great Chicago Fire started the evening of Sunday, October 8, 1871, and burned until the morning of Tuesday, October 10. It spread quickly to the north and east, crossing the river, and finally destroying an area of the city four miles long and one mile wide. The fire killed an estimated 300 people and left 100,000 people homeless. Roughly one-third of the city lay in ruins. Those who survived the Great Chicago Fire never forgot what they'd been through. The blaze produced countless tales of bravery and heroism, but the fire also changed the way that firefighters and public officials thought about fire safety. Lauren Tarshish is the author of the I Survived series. One of her recent books is I Survived the Great Chicago Fire. She sat down with Casey Grant from the National Fire Protection Association to discuss one of the most famous fires in American history. I love most about writing the I Survive series is that I get to do research and I often meet amazing experts who take me back into history, share their knowledge, and today I'm so excited to be here with Casey Grant from the National Fire Protection Association. So how did the fire really start, Casey? In the case of the Great Chicago Fire, there was a lot of fanfare over Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicking over the lantern. The legend is that Mrs. O'Leary's cow in a barn kicked over a lantern and that caused the entire fire. And poor Mrs. O'Leary and her family had their lives ruined because of this. We do know that the fire started at that location, but how it started, um, the official cause of that fire is unknown. But we do know there was a terrible drought. The entire city was made of wood. Not just the buildings, but sidewalks. Right. Sawdust was even used to try to help control the dust in the roads. It really created a very flammable situation. It was really a disaster waiting to happen. So the fire started on that Sunday evening. The conditions, weather-wise, were not good. Right, hot and windy, right? That's right. They actually had several fires uh, in the days and weeks preceding, including a very major fire I believe it was the day before. The day before, and it exhausted all of the firefighters. Absolutely. Yeah. By the time they were set up and really began to fight this fire, it had already gotten tremendous headway and was sweeping through the neighborhoods, and they were really outgunned from the very beginning. Right, because the firefighters at the time, of course, didn't have fancy fire engines and... Well, they had horse-drawn horse yeah. steamers right. using coal to run the pumps. It was a much different technology than what we have today. There are many diary entries and letters written by people who survived that fire that day. People described looking up and it was almost beautiful in a horrifying way that they would look up at the sky and it almost looked like it was filled with fireflies or fireworks. And those were these embers that were being driven by the wind and setting fires all over the city. Right, and from the standpoint of the firefighters, they can make a stand and try to have a line of defense at the river or wherever, but the embers are just blowing right over them and they can't keep up with it. So Casey, how did people survive this terrible fire? In any disaster like this, people survive any way they can. Situations like a great fire that's moving along, chasing them. Refuge, in some cases, would be in the river or, or Lake Michigan. Uh, really, anywhere you could go to get beyond it or get to the outskirts of town. Most people were able to get out of the way and survive, right. so except for those few unfortunate people. One 
one of the reasons why we remember the Great Chicago Fire, why it is really the most famous fire in American history, is because it, of how it has changed the way we build cities. We build our cities today with fire protection in mind and people don't even realize it. The width of streets are put in not only for convenience of vehicles and so forth, but as fire breaks. Right. They're natural fire breaks. The exterior of the buildings are uh, much more fire resistant in terms of design. We want to keep fires confined to the building of origin if it does occur and not spread from building to building to building. Uh, like we've seen in some of these great fires. So tell me about Fire Prevention Week. Fire Prevention Week is celebrated every year in the beginning of October in recognition of the noteworthy disaster that happened in Chicago. And we look at Fire Prevention Week as an important uh, chance to remind ourselves of the importance of fire safety for everybody. Fire safety is everyone's business. Casey, I'm not the only one who gets to ask you questions. We have some great questions from fifth graders from Myron J. Francis Elementary School in East Providence, Rhode Island. And their first question is, how come the 185 firefighters in Chicago didn't try harder to put the fire out? Well, I think those firefighters tried as hard as was humanly possible right. to put that fire out, just like they do today. Firefighters today, they're our heroes, uh, they work so hard doing what they do, but sometimes the odds are stacked against right. you, and that clearly was the case here. Right. They were outgunned from the very beginning, arriving to this massive fire that was already well beyond their control, uh, already exhausted from the previous fires they were fighting. There, there was nothing for them to do other than just do their very best, which they did. And here's a question for me. How did you feel writing about this life-turning event? Like all of the I Survive topics, it's a harrowing experience in many ways, reliving these events. What was really interesting about the Chicago Fire research was that there was so much to read that were what was actually written by people who were there. So reading letters and diaries and essays and articles written at the time, I actually had the feeling that I was being pulled back in time to the, the night of that fire. So it was a very powerful experience and I felt a great connection to the people of Chicago after finishing this book. So we saw that clip, showed a lot of things, and thinking back 1871 and the reality as we saw in that, or at least the legend of a cow kicking over that lantern and causing the situation that caused such havoc amongst this community. Yeah, and this is why um, we've talked that this whole idea of fire prevention uh, has begun and continues. You would think, you know, say, well, it's almost 150 years ago, but just a few, you know, back in the 70s when I was a mm -hmm. young kid, I remember the big fire in Chelsea. I could see the smoke from my house mm -hmm. here in Somerville. And, you know, they wasn't as big as that, but, you know, there was a lot of uh, buildings destroyed and, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the city. And it's really, that's just the things we've been talking uh, about on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. You know, make, making sure there's not combustibles around, making sure, uh, you know, the, the sources of ignition uh, are, you know, kept away from them. And that's why we have these fire prevention rules and regulations. And, and, and then that's why we want the practice in our house. Yeah. It's, it's really just a different scale. Mm -hmm. You know, we always tell the children when we go in, small fires, I mean, big fires start small. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of other points I wanted to make sure we covered. The importance of replacing your smoke detector every 10 years. I know on a previous show you had brought in a smoke detector <laughs> to actually do the demonstration right. so people are familiar. Uh, with what it sounds like and I think you mentioned earlier too the importance of responding and reacting when you do hear that I mean you do sometimes if you live in a place where fire alarms are often going off um, I don't know if people just kind of become immune to the sound of it but there no longer seems to be that sense of urgency mm -hmm. I myself used to live in a high-rise so you could put the TV on and see the lobby and it was like 
oh, the firemen are moving quickly. And it was like, <laughs> I should, you know, probably, but the reality is they would go off so often that people, you kind of were like, oh, is it a situation? And then realizing in retrospect, the appropriate response every single time was to walk out of the house and make certain that you were in a safe designated meeting place and that way you knew that the situation was being handled. Yeah, I think you should always investigate the alarm when it goes off. Mm -hmm. uh, but getting back to your original point, you should have, like I always say, your best protection at home, mm -hmm. working smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors. Uh, you want to check them at least once a month, push the test button, mm -hmm. change the batteries twice a year, you know, yeah. change the clock, change the battery. And you're right, you, you know, they should be re um, replaced every 10 years. And the way to, to, to find out the manufacture date is you take it down and it's on the back of it. It tells you the manufacture date. Yeah, that was actually great information that I learned on the show at one point. I wasn't aware that they had an expiration mm -hmm. date to mm -hmm. them. And realizing, you know, it's one of the things you put it up. And when the, um, the carbon monoxide detectors, when those became a requirement, it was the same thing. You just kind of put it up and no sense of like that you would need to know at a certain period of time, you'd have to replace it. Yes, yeah, and, and, and especially replace those batteries twice mm -hmm. a year. Definitely, as we talked about, that's the easiest way to do it when you change the clock. Take care of that. Mm -hmm. Another important point to cover is the placement of smoke detectors, where they should be in someone's home. Right, so we need to have, one, um, have them on every level of your home, mm -hmm. from the basement to the attic, uh, and carbon monoxide detector too and you need to have them within 10 feet of, a be of every bedroom, mm -hmm. uh, the combination one. So if you've got a 20 foot long hall, you can put one right in the middle and mm -hmm. that will cover all the bedrooms on that hallway. Now if you've got a 25 foot hall, you're gonna need two of them. Right. So you need them on every level within 10 feet of the bedroom. You can put, and you can have those like $5 just cheap smoke detectors mm -hmm. in the bedrooms for extra protection. Right. Well that makes sense because you're really, when you think of the destruction that fire causes, it makes sense to be as protected as possible when you're looking at your own and your family's safety. I mean, there is no cost that you shouldn't be willing to bear for that. Yeah, there's no cost. And I don't think you could ever have too much protection. You know, you'd rather have too much than not enough. Uh, another thing we talk about it this time of year, now it's getting cool, the heating yes. season's coming. So you wanna make sure that you have your uh, burner or boiler serviced by a licensed professional. Mm -hmm. um, because that, that's the, you know that builds up carbon monoxide inside. Of, you know if you have a wood so stove, it's creosote. So you want these mm -hmm. things checked by a professional, cleaned by a professional. Now that the heating season's coming. Uh, yes, we just had the first day of fall, and it did definitely feel very fall-like yesterday. So as we start thinking of the cooler weather coming, and at some point, snow will be coming our <laughs> way as well. But if we could start with um, space heaters, talk a little bit about the importance of using those safely. Yeah, space is the first and most important thing is to know there shouldn't be any left around, but kerosene space heaters are mm -hmm. totally illegal and very, very dangerous. So if you or someone you know has it, get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, now, so we have these electric ones, some of them oil filled or some of them are just radiated heat. You want to keep them three feet from anything that can burn. Mm -hmm. um, curtains, furniture, yourself. Uh, you want to plug it directly into the wall. Any heavy appliance, you know, uh, the space heater, uh, an air conditioner in the summer, mm -hmm. uh, your refrigerator, you want to have it plugged directly into the wall. You don't want to use an extension cord for something that's uh, pulling a lot of mm -hmm. power. Um, the other thing is that we recommend if you're using space heaters, when you get up to, even if you're just going to the bathroom, shut it off. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely when you go to bed, shut it off. Unplug it, you know. You just mm -hmm. don't want to leave them there. And it's got to be three feet from anything that can ignite. Mm -hmm. And as we said, snow will be coming our way at some point and the importance of making certain that the vents in your home are not blocked by the snow. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the, nowadays they, there's a lot, especially when you have new homes are, you know, a lot, there's a lot of, you know, re remodeling going mm -hmm. on and they have these direct vent uh, boilers and burners and they, it's, you know, they don't go through the chimney anymore. Mm -hmm. They go right out through the, the sill or the foundation. It's a little PVC pipe. You've probably mm -hmm. seen it. And they're usually low to the ground. And, right. you know, all right, if we don't have a big winter, you know, bad snow winter, maybe it's not a problem. But we've had a couple of really bad yeah. ones where they can, you know, you might be shoveling and not realize it right. and block it. And that's where the carbon monoxide law came from. Yeah. Uh, a family, I believe they were in Plymouth, their, their, their uh, vent got blocked and the mm -hmm. family perished from 
carbon monoxide poisoning. So you want to make sure that's clear. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I feel like we do talk about that every year, but sadly, every year we continue to hear stories in the news that families are, thankfully, sometimes they're able, someone finds them or one family member is able to get assistance for the others. But consistently, every winter, we're still hearing about people being overcome by carbon monoxide due to having the vents blocked from snow blowing or, you know, just not realizing it. Yeah, and that's why we want you to make sure you have a, a licensed professional, mm -hmm. you know, maintain that, that uh, heating element for you because it does, it happens, mm -hmm. it's, and it doesn't take much. It's not, you know, carbon monoxide can build up in our bodies too. So it might not be like this huge giant leak, but if, you know, you're home and, you know, overnight sleeping and mm -hmm. this stuff is building up. And we always tell me the, the symptoms of carbon monoxide poison. It's like kind of like a cold, you know, you're, you know, congested, mm -hmm. you, uh, you might be, you start getting sleepy or drowsy. Mm -hmm. So if you have those symptoms, you know, you might want to open a window, call 911. Mm -hmm. Always better to be safe. I mean, no first responder is ever going to have an issue with responding to your home and finding out that there's not an emergency. I think those are probably the best calls of every day. <laughs> yeah, that is, that's true. You know, often people say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, like, no, you know, first of all, it's our job. Mm -hmm. And we want to protect the public. And, and you're right. We do like when it's not when it's nothing. You know, when maybe a spider crawled across mm -hmm. the detector and set it off. <laughs> that is. The <laughs> I, best I know way. one of my friends here. Uh, when he was going to his promotional uh, interview, they said, "What was the the uh, best uh, day of your career?" And he said, "The day we never went out the door, because mm -hmm. that means everybody's safe." That is true, particularly in a community like ours. As we know, we are very densely populated. There are a lot of us living here, and it really takes all of us to keep each other safe. That's true. So, did you have any last closing thoughts? I just want to thank you again. Um, I really enjoy doing this. I tell you, it's my uh, vocation. I love getting the information out to the public. And uh, if anybody has any questions, you can always call us at, here through the City of Somerville Fire Department, or you can go online to uh, mass.gov, to the DFS uh, website, Department mm -hmm. of Fire Services, and that has all the information you, you need. Mm -hmm. That really, that is a great website. It has tons of resources, handouts, lots of interesting things. And we did learn this year that Sparky the Fire Dog, who we've had on in previous shows, <laughs> has a new friend, Simon. So Simon is a smart, resourceful character who is gonna work with Sparky to spread as much fire-related safety information as possible. So just another great way to engage with community, make certain people have the necessary information and resources to keep safe. Yeah, I mean, whatever works to get people to interact with us, you know, and if, if they retain it, I mean, that's what we want. We want mm -hmm. you to retain it, practice it, live it, learn it. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you, as always, for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time. This is one of the most important shows that we do to provide this information to our community. So I appreciate you taking time away to do so. No, thank you, Nancy. I really I, I enjoy it. My pleasure. Thank you. As always, I'd like to thank the production crew, Joe Constantine and George Woods. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.